Happy Friday, guys, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Dubs. I'm your host, Bilty. Another Friday, another podcast coming to you, and this one is no different. On today's show, I've got John Brewster, who's a uh, drag racer, engine builder, fabricator. Uh, he's a man of many talents out of the UK. He's been in the drag racing scene there forever. Uh, he just so happened to have his shop right around the corner from Spike's Vintage Restorations, my buddy Andy's shop there in the UK, and I decided to stop in and get him on podcast. So he's got a lot of history in the VW scene, was there in the early days of drag racing in the UK. So it's a great podcast and a good listen. And we'll kind of touch back to that in just a second, but I wanted to give a shout out to some of our supporters. I want to give a shout out to Jeff Straw out of Los Osos, California, picked up a t-shirt and a sticker pack. Appreciate you for supporting the podcast. Uh, he's building... So he's building a 56 Euro oval with a Type 4 engine, a 901 trans on disc brakes and IRS chassis. His parents sold their 56 Euro on 66 to pay my birthing costs. So it's sort of a legacy for me. And he says he loves the podcast, man. Hey, I appreciate you, Jeff. Like you don't even know supporting the podcast. So thanks so much. If you guys want to shout out, make sure that you go to letstalkdubs.com, pick up some merch. I do have sweatshirts out now, so you have to go check them out. I haven't had a chance to sit down in front of the website yet and get some stuff dialed in, but you go to the store, you can find a couple sweatshirts and stuff on there. So get geared up for the cold, crisp winter that's on its way. If you want a shout out, go to letstalkdubs.com, pick up some merch, or leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcast, and don't forget to leave your name in the review. So we appreciate those that appreciate Let's Talk Dubs podcast. Also, don't forget Ross Wolf, high quality aftermarket parts built for enthusiasts by enthusiasts. Go check out their website, rosswolf.com. They have some pretty cool stainless steel bus deck lid hinges. So if your bus deck lid hinges are kind of janky or your shifter's all funky and it ain't shifting right, make sure you guys go check out Ross Wolf and take a look at their stuff they've got on their website. A lot of parts and pieces that they have for improvements, uh, some car jewelry, some different things that accent your motor, make it look good, but also a lot of functional parts that fix existing problems like their dash bus dash cover. You got a 60 split window bus with a hacked up dash, they got your cover plate for you. So save you all the weld and all that stuff. It just covers that raggedy old hole and it looks pretty slick. So I got one for my bus, get one for your bus and go check them out at rosswolf.com. Also don't forget, Go subscribe today at vwtrendsmagazine.com. A magazine back from the past on the scene again, showing the variety of things that are in the VW scene. A little bit of East Coast, a little bit of West Coast, a little bit of air-cooled, water-cooled, and a bunch of how-tos. So go check those guys out. Subscribe today at vwtrendsmagazine.com. If you guys happen to go to One Crazy Weekend this year, you saw Eric Arnold's display, the photographer. He also just put out a new book called Dub dogsbook.com is where you can pick it up and he put together um a, a compilation of it's four years in the making for his book and uh he sold quite a bit of them one crazy weekend another limited production so you guys want to get one if you're into dogs and you're into volkswagens this is a cool book so he's got a lot of time in, in creating this book and it's people the dogs and the volkswagens that belong with each other or, you know, people, their dogs, and their Volkswagen. So a lot of us have our four-legged friends as part of our family. So if you're into that, go check out dubdogsbooks.com. And you can put in a discount code LTD Podcast, and you'll receive a few dollars off the order. So put in the discount code LTD Podcast at dubdogsbook.com. So go check it out. It's a cool book, a lot of cool Volkswagens and dogs in it. So I know you'll dig it. So go check it out. So today's podcast is John Brewster. Uh, he's got a history going way back in the UK, early drag racer with a company called Autocavan. He rode their, he drove their drag car uh, back in the 80s, uh, 1988 in Santa Pod, like tons and tons of stuff. I mean, he's been involved in the uh, VW DRC for, for years, you know, in the origins of it. He's got his car, Unfinished Business, that he still runs. I think it runs 10s. And uh, he owns a company called jb's elite fabrication so i'll leave some links in the bottom below give him a follow he's an og from way back that's been uh doing big things in the uk and he's an unbelievable mechanic fabricator drag racer engine builder and all of the above so it's some good early history 
with the UK drag racing scene and a lot of how that came together. So uh, without any further ado, guys, let's get into this week. John Brewster, drag racer, one of the old school UK guys on this week's Let's Talk Dubs. You probably don't know that there's a new Volkswagen out that doesn't look like a Volkswagen. Okay, everybody, so on today's show, uh, I'm still here in the UK and just got back from the Air Mighty show over in uh, the Netherlands and back here at Andy's shop. And it just so happens that his neighbor is John Brewster. And John Brewster is a known drag racer here. Uh, he's been involved in the VW scene for quite a few years here in the UK. And so on today's podcast, I want to welcome John Brewster from United Kingdom to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Yeah. So the way that we always start the podcast, John, uh, I know you've got a long history of drag racing here in the UK and where we start with everything is what's your VW story and how did you get into Volkswagens? The first Volkswagen I had was in 1975 and it was a 64, um, pretty tatty old thing, a 1200 obviously. And, uh, yeah, hand, it was hand painted, and it cost me about six pounds. Yeah, which, uh, <laughs> six pounds for the car. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, it was a deal that um, one of my work colleagues got. He bought about four cars um, from somebody because he wanted a particular car, mm -hmm. and he had to buy all four of them. So. Um, he let me have it for six pounds. Oh, wow. So he picks up a package deal and then you get the runoff of the deal, huh? Yeah, he didn't want the Beagle. And so how old were you at this time? Um, I was uh, 18. So at 18 years old, did, had you been looking at Volkswagens and thinking, I want to maybe get into those? What was the VW scene like out here? I mean, what motivated you to, to look? Or was it just, hey, it's super cheap and I'm going to get into it? That's exactly what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anyway, I <clears throat> we have obviously we have MOTs over here, yeah. which is for road checking for roadworthiness. So I checked it over, didn't know anything about Beetles at all. Um, I'd look round it, a little bit of rust. So I did. I was already a welder, so I welded a few little bits up, and um, it had uh, it, the kingpins were warm. Yeah, pretty standard, isn't it? And uh, so I bought a kingpin kit from a place called Autocavern in Farnham. Yeah. Which is the first time I'd ever heard of them. Right. Um, and I think the Kingpin kit cost me about two pound 50. Wow. <laughs> so I did the job. We had, I worked in a workshop because I, I, I was a Prince mechanic at the time. Okay. So um, I reamed out the bushes, hammered it all together. Thought the lights were a bit dim, but uh, six volt. So um, it was, and it, what, what year was the car? 64? Uh, 1964, yeah. And they were still six volt? Oh, yeah, six, yeah, the, six, six volt. Yeah. yeah, what am I thinking? Yeah. And um, anyway, so I bought some cheap remold tires for it because it had been off the road for quite a while. Yeah. And that was it. So you got that thing on the road. And then as you buy a Volkswagen, did you start to see a community around the VW people? Did you start congregating with other VW people? How, how did you start getting pulled into like the, the VW scene per se? Um, not with that car. Yeah. A couple of years later, um, I started going out with a, with a, a girl that was lived somewhere near the workshop where I worked. And um, funnily enough, her father owned Autocavan. Which wow. was a Volkswagen, a, you know, a Volkswagen dealer. Sorry, not dealer, but a Volkswagen independent parts specialist place. Yeah, but just just parts or no service. Um, they had a workshop mm -hmm. in Farnham, in Bagshot Lee, and um, which, funnily enough, is where I bought the, the Kingpin kit from. So you start dating this girl, and 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 
give me an idea how big that shop was. Was that like the premier VW repair shop in? in uh, not in, not back in the not back in the seventies. Mm -hmm. No, um, there was only one, and it was owned by Jeff Thomas. And um, we got chatting about various things, and about a year later, I. I, I, after I passed my uh, vehicle technician apprenticeship, I started working for him. Oh, really? So you're working for the girlfriend's dad? Yeah. Is she still the girlfriend? Uh, no. Okay, so that. <laughs> um, no, we we got married. We married. Oh. Few, we got married for a few years. Yeah. Uh, we married for ten years, and um, what with me working a lot of hours and etc., it it petered out. Yeah. We still know each other. We're still with no animosity at all. Right, so, right. Yeah, we're happy. So, uh, so it was called Auto Cavan. Auto Cavan, yeah. Auto Cavan, and they were a VW supply house or import car parts supply house with a service bay too. And yes. So you, <clears throat> so you were apprenticing as a mechanic, and then after your apprenticeship, you go and start working there full time. Yeah, basically the engine, the workshop there mm -hmm. mainly did engines. And um, Jeff Thomas used to race, uh, or built and raced a Rallycross 1302. Oh, really? And um, <clears throat> he was also involved in uh, modifying the first Mark One Golfs that came out with suspension kits mm -hmm. and engine conversions, twin Webers, that sort of stuff, before the GTI came out. Because <clears throat> he bought a brand new Golf in 1976, uh, yeah. which was a 1600 LS. And that was converted in over the years into a full-on circuit racer, which was the quickest uh, Volkswagen Golf in in Europe at one time on wow. the circuits. It won it won championships, and I mechanicked on that car, built engines, and then while I was in the workshop there, I was building, started building performance Volkswagen air-cooled engines. And so you started learning. Uh, so at a young age, you're you're in there, you're apprenticing, you start building engines uh, a couple years in. And with performance engines, what are some of the things that, because I mean, building a stock motor is fairly simple, right? I mean, it's not something that's going to rev like a beast. It's just a, it's just kind of a put around and get it done motor. And then building performance motors. What were some of the things that you were doing back then or had to be taught to do differently than doing on a stock rebuild? when you were doing performance engines? Well, first off, I'd never built a Beetle engine. Oh, <clears throat> never? No. Up to that point, I'd never done one when I started at Autoclan. Mm -hmm. But I had a lot of experience building other engines, um, you know, conventional four-cylinder water-cooled stuff. Sure. And I had worked on cars since I was about 10 years old. So, um, so I, you're mechanically inclined already. Yeah, ridiculously so, apparently. Yeah. And what's the first thing you think? I mean, because it's with any of the other like inline four stuff like that, anything's got a split case motor is a whole different deal to build than a solid block engine, right? Yeah. There's a lot of checking to do on the crankcase. Yeah. The ma the main thing on a on a Beetle engine or air cooled engine like that is the crankcase, the condition, and the the structural integrity of the crankcase. Where you know how because magnesium. It doesn't like living a long, long time without having problems because it goes soft and threads pull quite easy and they go crumbly and they corrode a lot in a lot of areas, especially around the bottom where the tinware screws on. And, and also, if they're not treated properly or they're revved too high for too long in standard engines, uh, they pound the case. Right. And once a, once a case is pounded... Um, you can line bore them to probably about four different sizes, which we used to do. Um, but they can spring the centre main and they don't torque up properly with the right tension between the two case halves. Right. And one, there was always the talk, you know, in, in Gene Berg's book, he always talked about, you know, his philosophy with building an engine was why start with a line board case that's been an engine case that's had the life pounded out of it. Why not just start with a brand new engine case, which was which was a big debatable thing in the early days of building motors and stuff. And he, he always attributed rebuilding engines with new cases and things like that with, with old cases would result in uh, low oil pressure and a couple other things. And But it was kind of the way that everybody was doing things. Everybody would line bore a case and get it trued back up. But again, like you said, there's a, there's a little bit of a... Uh, 
a little bit of softening that happens with the magnesium. And, and you look at when Volkswagen developed the Type 4, which was the next evolution of the four, flat four motor, they went with a solid aluminum crankcase, you know, understanding that the heat cycles that go on those motors, um, that was just the next evolution. So when you're... So you're helping uh, helping him prep his race car, all that kind of stuff, and then is is there any flat four VW racing that he's doing as well? Was it because that was the GTI he was racing or the Golf? Um, he he at the time he uh, had had the Rallycross Beetle, which he rallycrossed. Oh, it was a Beetle he was rallycrossing? Oh yeah, sorry, yeah. It was, oh, okay. a, it was a two point three Beetle, and he and this when I came along the scene, he was on his second Rallycross Beetle. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a fantastic car. Yeah. And um, it was 2.3. Um, yeah, I mean, um, it was, you know, crankcase-wise and everything, it was fairly well built on a budget. The crankcase that we use on that had been used, line board, all sorts. And it was making good power. And uh, it was competitive, very competitive, especially when, when the conditions were a bit damp. Right. Stuff. Uh, it made good power. It had you know had the usual IDAs on it. We ran it at one point with it on alcohol. Oh wow! And um, we tested it in the snow once, and that's when I got a chance to drive it. And, um, and how was that? Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. You could, you could do anything you like with it. Full Just of it, lock sideways. It, it really, he really had it set up well. You control it with the throttle. Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. superb. I couldn't believe it when I drove it. Yeah. Fantastic. So that, that gets you behind the wheel of a performance Volkswagen. Yeah. And then is that when you got kind of, pardon the pun, but bit with the bug of like, I want to build a fast car or what? Yeah. Well, when I started um, at Auto Cavan, mm -hmm. I had to build a bug. There was like a requirement for the job? No, I required it because I'd been building these performance engines, doing head work, putting big valves in because we used to have to make carburetor carburetor conversions there was there was no throttle linkage you could buy you have to make it all mm -hmm. and we used to make all that rose jointed um for to convert to dual carburetors yeah yeah and uh, even, uh back then there was auto command used to make their own single um single car single twin choke carb things like 34s and stuff right and they had their own unit manifolds made and a lot of guys would use those ports. they'd use those holly carburetors too right like we, a we did used to use a holly bug spray 200 cfm and a 300 cfms right and sometimes you duel those things too right yeah we used to run them yeah we used to used to do a lot of those they work really well on 1835s and 7076s stuff like that and so what's so you start building your own car what do you build for yourself at this time i had a 19 i had a 1970 1500 um, and this was in about 19, this must have been in about 1978, 79, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it was only a few years old, but it had been crashed in the front. Um, that's the only reason I could afford to buy it. So, so you get the car, you decide you're going to rebuild the whole thing? So I, the, the front was repaired mm -hmm. and I wanted a 1835 for it. Um, it had single port heads and stuff, so I took the engine out rebuilt it couldn't afford to import heads and stuff like that so i put big valves in the old uh, single port really ported it all out and um yeah i put front rear roll bars conies a, a set of slot mag wolf race wheels really and um yeah that uh so was that pretty common back here back i mean if you're building motors to just big valves from single port heads, if you can't afford a new set of heads type thing? Not many people did it because That's, when we built them for people, generally they, they, we started with new cylinder heads. Yeah. And we put big valves in them and stuff because you couldn't really buy that sort of stuff. You had to make everything. Back then we had to make performance heads, make throttle linkage, you know, a, a lot of stuff that you take for granted now. You just go along and order it and there it comes, you know. Yeah, I just I was just uh, at the Air Mighty show and there was a guy that had some kind of homemade linkage, which was just basically like an angle iron bar that had two holes and it was mounted through the fan shroud and then had two fixed joints for the Himes, you know, for the carburetor control. And it was interesting because it was for sure homemade. And he says, yeah, I don't know where I, I found it at a swap meet somewhere and I thought it looked really cool and he, he made it work on his car. But I can totally understand what you're saying about trying to get that dual carb set up. You know, nobody had cast caps for the top of the carburetors <laughs> to put, you know, the, to, to put the tyke, the Taco linkage or any of that kind of stuff. So we, we basically mirrored the Type 3 linkage. 
because that's, okay. that's my preferred type of linkage. The push pull. Yeah. Yeah. Because it 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 compensates for the different width of the engine at different mm-hmm. heats better than the uh, up and down. In my opinion. Mm-hmm. And and whenever I've made that linkage for myself, I've always I've always made that style. And so what? So this car, this seventy Beetle that you're building. You obviously got to go through and build the front end. Do you just, do you make this, is this specifically a drag car? Like I'm going to build a drag no. car or you're like, I'm going to build a street car. Yeah. Basically it was a, it was my, it was in my everyday street car. So your everyday driver's got an 1835 single port with big valves, ported heads and twin carbs. No, no, I had, um, a single 40, uh, yeah, a 40, I had a 40 odd F on it. Oh, 40 IDF, a dual... Yeah, single one. Two, or, two runners? In the middle, yeah. Nice. How'd that car run? Um, I had, I had, a, had a, a fairly uh, racy cam in it, which um, anybody that runs these single twin choke carb on them know that you don't get a very good idle. And they're tricky to get to s- stop stumbling. Right, because the, the firing order and there's no balance tube on it. Yeah, and also there's um, not enough, you don't, the carburetor doesn't get enough signal on the idle circuit. Right. But I used to drive it flat out everywhere, so it didn't really matter. <laughs> but, you um, you it, mastered the two-footing driving experience at the stoplights and keeping it running. and. But handbraking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that was a quite, quite a quick car. It yeah. was quite a quick car. Back in the day, you got to remember what was about. Then. No, no, absolutely. I mean, yeah. a stock Beetle would run twenty-four seconds in the quarter mile. So anything, yeah. you know, anything picking up faster than that. I mean, and you're out there driving this hot, hopped-up Beetle. Uh, are you? Is there any kind of street scene where guys are meeting up and maybe racing in back alleys and stuff like that, or any of this stuff? We, we did. Back in the day, there was a lot more not actual street racing, not around where I lived. Um, but what there was, was anybody with a sort of a quickish car or what they class as a quick car. And back then there was things like three lit, 3000 CC Capris that we had three litre Capris, mm-hmm. um, V eight Rovers, stuff like that. And the Beetle would blow them away up to about a hundred. After about a hundred. Yeah. So you're talking, you're doing like freeway, freeway racing. Basically, highway racing. Yeah, coming up to traffic lights, and if anybody's got anything a bit warm, you'd hang back and you know. Yeah. So not like it wasn't the states, obviously. Right. But, um, it was, it was things like Triumph Dolomite sprints, which were back then they were classed as quite quick cars, or Marina eighteen hundred TCs. People thought they were quick. They weren't. Yeah. Um, but the Beetle off the lights just absolutely nailed them. And, nice. And uh, I used to regularly come up against this guy in a three litre Capri um, at the same traffic lights when we, we must have left work similar times and uh, he never ever beat me away from the lights. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's, I mean, that's got to give you a good feeling, right? So you're beating these newer cars and you're in your old Beetle that everybody kind of looks at like, what's this old bu- bucket of bolts doing over here? So the, the, is it, do you think it's the underdog aspect of Volkswagens that kind of pulls you to them? Yeah, I reckon it must be. I never really thought about it before, but it's nice having something that, that's quick, you know, that isn't expected to be quick. I used to get, because I used to drive fairly quick, mm-hmm. and we had some big roundabouts now around near Farnham, and there was one big roundabout that was probably about probably about four or five lanes wide. Oh, really? And you could really get some speed up on it. Yeah. And I used to go around that roundabout, a um, little bit of opposite lock and, you know, really power around it. Yeah, just and kind of it, drift around that, what they call drifting nowadays, kind of bring not the... Not really, but sort of a neutral drift, you know, not, not, yeah. not hanging the back right out. Yeah, yeah, but, just barely pushing the edge where you were just yeah. pushing the back of it out. And I, I, was, I, I was pulled up for speeding on roundabouts by the police and stuff. And, and I just said it was in a 70 mile an hour limit and I was doing 70, what's the problem? <laughs> and... Um, Often I, I got, I, I used to get pulled up quite a bit. Yeah. Thinking about it now, it's not surprising really. Yeah. Did you, yeah. I mean, were they, did you kind of start uh, having to pay attention, obviously where you're going, looking for these cops and making sure nobody's bothering you? Do yeah. you, does there, do you run across a, a, a scene of people? I mean, what's the first show you start going to? Do you build a drag car? Like how does it evolve 
into um, you racing. All oh, right, that um, I was, I was, I'm not just, I was, wasn't, and I'm not just into Volkswagens. Mm -hmm. I like all sorts, hot rods. Um, I, I, I built, I built hot rods with V8s in and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> I used to go to a local drag place, which was not really a drag strip. It was an airfield that they used to shut off at the weekend. A place called Blackbush. Yeah. Uh, in, sort of near Fleet Way in, in England. And, um, and this is in the 70s still? Uh, or... Yeah, yeah. And we used to go up there and I used, I used, I used to run the Beetle. They didn't call it Run What You Brung then, they called it something else, which mm -hmm. I can't remember. And it, between some of the racing, we used to just take cars around and, and, uh, and it, yeah, I mean. And just kind of call people out and say like, hey, I want to race you, let's go out here. It, it, it ran, I mean, at that place, it ran 14, 9, 15, 1, Which is something like that. Very, I mean, when people think like it doesn't sound fast at today's standards, a, a, a new Chevelle in the States would run maybe a mid-14, like a big block Chevelle, mm -hmm. which is going to be your super fast car. The Mopars, which everybody thinks were faster than they were, those were, you know, 15-second cars all day. So when you're talking 14 seconds, I mean, that's flying yeah, for a Volkswagen. Yeah, it, it did a few 49s, but mainly it sort of 15.1 or 15.2. So. Was there other people out there in Volkswagens with you? No. You were the only guy out there? With that, the Volkswagen, yeah, there's all sorts of other stuff. Really? Most of it was slower. And did people, after a few a few weekends of you coming out there and racing, people stop wanting to race you or what? Uh, they... No. Or you'd wait for the new guy to show up. No, they they used to pull out of the line. Really? Oh, if they were lined up against you, they didn't want to get shamed against the Beetle? <laughs> that happened later on in, in um, when I started racing this, the uh, the one that we raced in the 80s. Really? The 1303 that's up there. Yeah. Um, people, so, I mean, I'll, I was, I wouldn't say I was known in the hot rod world, mm -hmm. but quite a few people knew the car that I built because it, it didn't follow the rules of building a hot rod. It was my right. way of doing it. Which car is this? It's a 1952 Ford Prefect. I don't even know what a Ford Prefect is. Is it a car? It's like, like a four-door Anglia. Okay. Like you have yeah, in the yeah, States. Yeah. It's like a four-door one of those. Um, and it's, it's it had a fairly well-tuned 289 and it with a four-speed uh, Borg Warner. So you always liked being in something unsuspecting that kind of surprises people. That's like that's your, that's your thing where you get maybe your kicks, huh? What you say, what you say, really float my boat. When I was a kid, <laughs> I'd buy a magazine called Hot Car. Yeah. And I, I had that. I started uh, reading that back in the si late sixties when I was at school, and um, I always used to turn straight to the readers' cars page, not readers' wives reader's cars page yeah. because I was always impressed with the people that did engine conversions yeah I mean the engine conversions are the fastest way to make something fast right just yeah. swap in a big motor so you've got the Beetle running it's it's the 70s and uh, you're out there running what did you say it was called Blackbush yeah Blackbush it was Blackbush Airport and we used to now and again they used to do the drag racing and so you're out there kind of just trying to catch a race on a Saturday night things like that and you're between the Ford and the Beetle, depending on what you want to take out for the night. Oh no! In the seventies, I didn't have I didn't have that. So you got the Ford I, later. I built, I built that in uh, 1982. Okay, so you've got you you've got the Beetle. You're running it just for fun. You're not campaigning oh, yeah. a car. No, no, just turn turned up. Let's have a go. Yeah. You know, and uh, did they ever race for money out there? No, no. It was just for just for pride. Just see what your car will run yeah you know, just like a really laid back run with your brung these and days and what, what was the fastest car around back then that you remember um any cars you remember that just had this history was, to them there was proper race cars there as well so yeah there was um uh there was a willie's a willie's coupe called slick willie yeah that ran quick there was a ford a ford pop or as you know in anglia called um oh, it's really it's really well known I'm trying to remember the name of it now. Um, it was built by Mickey Bray and raced, and it had a, I think it had a 440 in it with twin, twin four barrels and a high rise and stuff, and that ran, that was street, fully street legal, and that ran 11s, which was well quick back in the 70s. 
And all this time you're still working at AutoCavan? Um, no, I, was, um, I worked at AutoCavan for about three years. Uh -huh. And then um, I went and did something else for, for a bit. So got out of the VW trade for a little while? Y yeah, yeah. Did something else. And then how do you, how do you end up getting back into it? Um, I uh, was still with um, the girlfriend, stroke wife at the time, and saw Jeff Thomas again, and he needed a manager. I'd been managing a workshop, um, a commercial workshop, and um, he needed a manager for the uh, Ipswich branch of Bort Cravan. So we had a discussion and decided that I'd take over as a manager there. It, I took over there in 1986. So you went back to Auto Cavan in 86. But in Ipswich, which is about 150 miles from Farnham. So we, we moved to Ipswich. So now you're in a whole different area now. Yeah. Move, move your whole thing. And now you're back in kind of the VW business. Yeah. And do you start, look, you still have the 70 or you look for another car and find another car? No, I, I, um, that, that died, that died a death. Yeah. What few, happened few, to the 70? What, what, what's the story with the 70? Um, I uh, it, I didn't have much time to work on it. It got a little bit tatty, and uh, a friend of mine had a Rover P6 V8, and um, it broke down. And I was I was towing it to the workshop with the Beetle, and uh, the workshop was about 15 miles from where I lived. You were towing a car with the Beetle? Oh yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> and um, on a rope, mm -hmm. and I was going down a dual carriageway. You're probably down about 50. And um, somebody pulled out of a lay-by straight in front of me up at the brakes on the rover, hit it out of the back. Oh, wow. And um, it, it cracked the engine case and destroyed the back of the car, basically. So, oh, that's a bummer. Yeah, that was um, that. Was that. So So that all that motor you had all that time, effort, and energy into was it dust done, that quick. It had done quite a, quite, it had done a few years and a lot of thrashing. Yeah. But yeah, it was a... Yeah, it was a it was a pretty quick 835 to be yeah, honest. especially for a single yeah. port motor yeah right i mean that's pretty impressive for a, a single port 1835 to run a 14 second pass that's hauling the mail yeah i mean re more regularly it did 15s but um yeah it did it did a couple of 49s and i was i was stoked yeah so you get you get working over there at the new or back at uh auto Caban in 86 <clears throat> Now you decide you want to get back. You, you kind of get the the desire to get back into racing. It wasn't it wasn't me actually. Mm -hmm. What happened was the first bug jam came in 1987, and um, between between us, we decided that we needed a car to take to to the first bug jam just to showcase the stuff that we sold and what we could do. So we we chose a. 1303 that had been in the company for a long time and um, built a 1968cc engine for it which was really basic a welded crank and uh, standard con it was a real cheap engine yeah uh, standard rods that I'd modified changed the rod bolts and had it balanced and polished the beams and that sort of stuff we had to keep it we had to keep it down and um, we did the suspension because I, I like handling as well and like uh, for for autocross and stuff like that you're talking yeah. about or on the road you know something that really handles right. and um <clears throat> i know that i know that the super beetles can handle that they're, they're my favorite beetle to be oh honest. yeah well, well it, for road handling it's the best beetle they're my favorite beetle anyway yeah and it upsets a lot of people because no not really many people like them i'm only meant to like ovals and early stuff apparently but I love 1303s. I like them all. Yeah. yeah. And um, I, um, oh, we did the suspension ni nicely, front and rear roll bars, lowered it. We had some MP8 spokes on it. Yeah. And uh, Pirelli P7s. And um, yeah, basically. So you're building this to be kind of a, kind um, of an all around vehicle. It's going to be like, it's going to be fast, but it's really designed to be really sporty Super Beetle. Like, it's going to be the fast, all-around car. Yeah, we, we widened the front wings a little bit. I mean, that was the... In 1987, 
the whole goal behind building your customized car was to make it more modern, make it like update everything on it, whether it's, you know, some guys would do power windows, some guys would do, uh, you know, the custom stereos, like anything you could to make it more updated and modern, you know, because the Beetle was so basic. And so it makes sense that in 87, you're like, we're going to build this thing and outfit it with the best suspension, the best, the best of all the bits and make kind of, and this was going to be kind of a shop car. Uh, yeah, basically. Yeah. It was, um, for displays, shows or what to showcase a lot of people at the time were wanting to buy all the Chrome Timware and all that sort of stuff, which I know I've never liked. I don't, I don't see the point of it, but people used to want it so we supplied it so we outfitted the engine with the accessories the the little bug pack breather boxes and the alley valve covers and the, you know the shiny tinware and all those sort of little bits and pieces that people could see on a car and then they think oh yeah i'd like that and they used to come into the shop and buy it and stuff and um we had the old mp8 spokes um with and uh, and the car sat low, but correct for the suspension geometry. Right. Not low to be scraping the ground or anything. Well, and you probably did wider uh, tires on it so that it had a little more grip. Yeah, we had um, Pirelli P7s, which were um, 195 5015s on it. That's a pretty fancy tire for a Volkswagen Beetle. Yeah, it was um, suited it. Especially in 87. I mean, nobody's running 195 50s on... I mean, they're still running one one thirty five. I mean, some of the guys in the street are on one thirty fives and one forty fives, which is yeah. a little narrow tire and one sixty five in the back. So, I mean, for for a lot of people, that's the look they want. Mm -hmm. But when you if you're going quick and you you turn into a bend or a roundabout, then you've got to do some fancy work on the steering wheel and the throttle to try and get them to go around, haven't you? Yes. Whereas um, the thirteen oh three, the way we set it up, um, the handling was fantastic. Yeah. You could chuck it sideways at 80 mile an hour and hold it there, full opposite lock. Really? Oh, yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. Stayed flat, like nice and flat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, we used to laugh our heads off driving it. So you are driving this car for a while, building it as a round, like just an all-around performance vehicle. And then and then what happened? After the for Bug Jam 1 was such a success, really. It was only a one-day event. It was such a success, and there was quite a few fairly quick Beatles there. And um, we started chatting you know, with, um, you know, Keith Hume, I presume, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, he was, I think he was, I think he'd started Volksworld then because mm -hmm. he was doing, custom, he was editor of Custom Car at the same time as Volksworld. He started that magazine. And um, I, I, I knew Keith fairly well. And we, we discussed things and then people got talking and they, and they were on about Bug Jam 2. And um, we thought we discussed starting a Volkswagen Drag Racing Club. So when the Volkswagen Drag Racing Club had a its inaugural meeting, I suppose, mm -hmm. to discuss whether it was a feasible op opportunity to actually have a Volkswagen Drag Racing Club, when it was realised there was enough people to get interested in doing it, we then converted the super handling car into a drag car into a straight line but it car. was still an everyday car at that point so what type what, what was the first thing on the list to do to that car to modify it um the first thing was an engine with some real bit more horsepower so what'd you put um i built a 2110 for it and i used to scat split port heads on it oh really and um that caused a, a bit of a problem uh, to build the engine about five times. With the split port heads? Yeah. Really? The reason for that was trying to get a cam combination that worked with it because of the size of the intake ports, the angle of the valves, and everything that's different about those heads. Because I'm pretty sure they were built for um, like midget cars and aircraft where the RPM was up there. Yeah, it's just going to run at 7,000 RPM constantly. Yeah, yeah well, on planes, a lower RPM, but consistent rpm so um, trying to find a cam that i was happy with i ended up um, trying about five different cams in it obviously with a beetle it's yeah. the engine change the cam do the geometry it's a job yeah not like a v8 where you just pop the cam out of the front <laughs> pop a new one in yeah 
So when I when we um, got with got with a combination that was nice and talky, allowed enough revs, and it had enough drive, um, we were happy with that because it it had to be a street car as well. So Bug Jam Two shows up. Do you get the car built for Bug Jam Two? Um, Bug Jam Bug Jam Two. I at that point I still had the old 1968 engine in it. Okay. And we were starting to do big burnouts because I like burnouts. Right. And I think people like burnouts. Yeah. And so I was doing like 7,000 RPM burnouts in it. And um, it, it, in the class that I was in, it, it qualified the quickest for the street in the street class. We what, what was it running at the time? I'm trying to remember. I, it was running... Um, it, I think it was... I think it ran 14.2 with that 1968 engine in. Okay. And that just had, and that was. Um, what well, carburetors were on it? It had 44 IDFs on it. So 44. So you weren't even trying. I mean, you could have gone bigger. Big, I mean, you're working for a place that has all the parts. So you could build the biggest monster you could. But, but this was the engine from the from the year right, before. Right. Right. So this um, year you you made some modifications for Bug Jam Two. Yeah. For the first. Yeah. Well, actually. For, Actually, that's not correct. It wasn't Bug Jam 2. It was that year we had three race meetings, and it was at the first race meeting mm-hmm. when I started doing big burnouts on that because, you know, burnouts. Because you're good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, I didn't. I wasn't running a sump extension because the year previously it was quite low, and um, we we didn't really need it at that point, and or I thought we didn't. And anyway, the, the first round eliminations. I did a burnout, came out the burnout, dipped the clutch, and, and the engine stalled. I thought, oh, crank, seized. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, wow. Obviously, I had, I had all starvation because of no, no some extension stuff. So you live and learn. And so for the next meeting, I took the engine out and um, threw a ridiculous cam in it um, that... that um, can't remember what cam it was, but it was quite a hot cam. And when I when I ran it up, it and I ran it up and down the um, the road where we, in this in the estate where we uh, got the workshop, it didn't it didn't want to rev. And because um, when you when you rebuild an engine, mm-hmm. you don't really want to go out and give it the big one, so you sort of f- right work feel your way it up. up a, yeah, feel it up a bit, and it didn't want to. I kept driving up and down, and it just didn't want to rev. And then I got angry with it, and I just revved. I just put my foot flat to the floor and thought, it's either going to blow up or it's going to rev. And it, when it went past about five and a half thousand revs, it really come on. Oh, really? Yeah, so there was, there was nothing under five and a half. Obviously, I'd chosen the wrong cam. Yeah. But so to help it along, we put a Bob Hatton 40 horsepower nitrous oxide kit on it. Oh, for the bottom end? Just for, yeah, to give it a bit of a wake up. And um, we did one meeting with it like that, and it it ran 13, I think it ran 13.2 with 40, 40 horsepower nitrous. Wow. And uh, on street tyres, proper street tyres. And then um, I, was pre- I was building the uh, 2110 with the scat heads. But because I had to keep taking it apart and trying different cams, I kept putting the old, the old engine back in so I could still use it. And um, anyway, I tested, I took the car to the uh, Street Rod Nationals, at, which was at Bruntingthorpe, when I put the 2.1 in, in engine it to test it. Because that was a weekend before the last race meeting. Okay. And um, I was testing it there on nitrous. With the forty horse shot of nitrous, forty horse shot the nitrous with the twenty one ten. And yeah. what's the setup on the twenty one ten? Like, do, what, what kind of does that have? The, that's got the, the twin port scat heads. It had the. It had this. What cam was in that thing? It had, uh, like a K eighty nine or K eighty seven. I. It had a. It had a. It had a scat cam in it. Oh okay. Which was. So like a C ninety five probably. No no, no the other. Uh, that's what the. Um, that's what the 1968 had in it. That was that mental cam. It had a C95. Yeah, uh, that's it. I just trying to remember. 
the one that was in it was um, I rem all I remember is it had 332 degrees duration and about 530 thou lift but that was a, it was a scat cam and um, then when I was um, I was running that and we were right and at Bruntingthorpe they used to have where the street rod nationals were mm -hmm. um, they had because it was an old old RA, uh, ex American RF Air Force base and they had a two mile long straight and the uh, the national the national association of street rods they actually borrowed some um, lights and they marked out quarter mile and you could do a quarter, quarter mile run there was no times mm -hmm. we just just had the, the tree and people with all sorts of cars chevys and anything that had a decent sized engine and it was running down the strip and when you take a Volkswagen Beetle, or back in the day, you take a Volkswagen Beetle to a hot rod event, everybody laughs at you and jokes and points. And yeah, stuff. you're like, what's this thing doing here? Because at the time, people didn't know they could be quick. And anyway, I, was, I did quite a bit of running that weekend, and everything I raced, I beat. Surprised a lot of people, huh? Yeah, and a lot of people were pulling out of the lineup when they knew they were going to be against the Beetle. Because they didn't, they didn't want to get shamed in front of their friends. Exactly, yeah. And um, there was one guy with a 12-second with a um, 57 Chevy, mm -hmm. Paul Craven. Bless him, he's now not with us. <coughs> he came along and uh, he went, yeah, I'll race you. And he, he'd seen that the car had been nip, nippy. And anyway, I, I'd seen him at Santa Pod at Gary's picnic and stuff, so I knew his car was quite quick. So I was like, right, I'm on it. Yeah. And um, so I ran against him and blew his doors off. Oh, really? Yeah. And on the way back, it, I say return road, but it was just a bit further over. He come up next to me and uh, he wound his window down and he looked at me and he said, what am I going to tell me, mate? Being beaten by a beetle. <laughs> and, you know, that was his attitude. He went, I'm never going to live this down. Yeah. And um, I'd since, after that, I'd raced him at Santa Pod as well and beat him there as well. Really? But um, but he was one of the only ones that really wanted to race against a beetle. He wanted, I mean, he, he saw that you were you were feisty and trying to take people out, so he was up yeah. for the challenge. He was, yeah. No, oh, that's good. He it's, was a really good bloke. Yeah, it's what makes good sportsmanship, right? Like if somebody sees a, sees a challenge and wants to, yeah. wants to take it out. Anyway... The next race meeting, which was the third one of the VWDRC, which the first year we only had three meetings. Mm -hmm. I just see how it was going to go. And then at that meeting, um, I basically ran a 12.27. Wow. It, all it had from it being a street car, which I used to use it to go to work and back. Well, it's a, it's a super beetle, right? Yeah. It's heavier than a regular beetle. Yeah. Yeah, quite a bit heavier. Yeah. And, it, and it ran, it ran, quick as it ran that on that meeting was a 12.27 with a 40 shot, a 40 shot of gas. 40 shot of nitrous and you're running what carburetors on it? Um, 48 Delortos. So you, you move it to 48, you're in the yeah. 40 shot of NOS. Yeah. And then you're running 12.28, which is really impressive. And this is a motor that's together for how long? Um, well, it, I'd only done the Street Road Nationals in it. Nice. And, um. Yeah, I was, and that's on proper street tires. None of these cheaters. No slicks, nothing. So you're no. you're spinning off the line, all that stuff. Yeah, massive burnout. Good excuse for a good burnout. <laughs> yeah. I was using Yokohama AWARs, which are a soft tire, but a proper street tire, you know, with proper amount of tread on and stuff. Not like some of them have got about three mil of tread. Yeah. And um, and took the silencer off, and put a stinger on. It had an alternator on it, fan belt, and everything else. So it was turnkey driver running 12s. Yeah. Nice. And what was the compression on that motor? Um, 10 to 1. So 10 to 1 compression with a shot of gas. That's that's really respectful for 1227s. And this is in the 80s, like 80, that probably was, 88? That was, that was 1988, yeah. Yeah, so 1988. And so now that you're starting to run a little bit faster, you're you're really enjoying this drag racing thing? Oh, yeah. I, I used to run cars that run with your brungs anyway. So, yeah. yeah we, uh, yeah, and then uh, we did did pretty well. Second year, 
um, won the championship. Uh, third year, won the championship. Um, <laughs> but we went from street to Super Street. Yeah. And then, then we, after the first year of Super Street, we were allowed to run slicks. So the car was exactly the same, but I just put slicks on it. Now, are you guys, at the time that you're racing, are you guys checking out what's happening over there in the States? Like oh, what yeah. you guys are doing over there? Yeah, we had all those, um, all the stateside videos. <coughs> you know, the PRA videos and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we were nothing like that, obviously. There was a couple of cars that were pretty quick in the modified class. Mm -hmm. and that was Terry's Beatles. They were just mental. You just didn't know what was going to happen, whether they were going to have a meltdown or whether it was going to go quick. <laughs> and because um, they're... Yeah, because um, they had two drivers. They had Luke, who was uh, he owned his uh, he owned the company, Derry's Beatles. And um, yeah, he had to, oh, I've got brain fade now. I can't remember. But he had he had two drivers in the car. Basically, it was him and his um, mechanic guy. Okay. Why well, can't I remember his name? It's all right. Because you didn't. See, if you knew you were going to be tested today, you would have studied. Oh yeah, yeah would have done. Yeah, <laughs> I know him. I can see him. Yeah, he, he builds. He owns the cog box now, and he builds a lot of racing gearboxes. Oh okay. Yeah yeah yeah. I've. Uh, I'll, I'll get there eventually. Yeah no, I I talked to him at the last Volks World show. Yeah. And um, yeah, so so these guys, so you you run the second season now of the V the what is it the VWDRC VWDRC. And who are the guys that are running back then in those days? Um, Bernie Smith. He, um, he'd he been racing a Beetle, actually, for a few years before that. Yeah. Um, you know, off his own. He used to ra race in regular drag racing, where they do all the weird powder weight and that sort of stuff I don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, there was um, John Mayer. He came along with uh, the Mr. Beetle Oval. Mm -hmm. Um Jim uh, Cow stateside. There was um, who else was it? A friend of mine, Jim Bowen, who is now my um, crewman. Yeah. He 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 won a few championships with uh, a race car called Beetlejuice. No, I remember Beetlejuice. Yeah, yellow, yellow yeah. Beetle. Yeah, yeah. He was a he was a good driver, good mechanic, consistent. He won the championship a few times. And so you guys are obviously the 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 drag racing community up here is pretty pretty tight knit. It's small, yeah. Yeah. What's some of the stuff that starts to push the hobby? I mean, who's the guy that you know we show up next year and then so and so pulls out of this and everybody's like, wow, this guy shipped this over from the states and now he's really going to cause trouble for us over here. Um, <clears throat> the um, the first car that I knew of that was shipped over was a Speedster that Brian Brian Bur Oh yeah, the was it Brian Burrows? Brian Burrows, yeah. Actually, I think I think somebody else bought that over first. It was uh, Brett Hawksby, I think, bought that over first. Okay. And then Brian either bought it or sponsored him or something. Um, and that was I can't remember whose one it was, but it was a Speedster that was turboed. And um, that ran okay, but it didn't run as hot as we thought it was going to. Mm -hmm. And then there was the De Koppen car, the red De Koppen car that um, Mark, I can't remember his name either, Mark, somebody, he was from the German car company. Okay. Mark, Mark Osborne. Mm -hmm. And they, they ran that car and that took a while to get that going. That was another turbo car. So people were just deciding, like, I'm going to go buy a car that was campaigned in the States yeah. and bring it over because you guys are kind of fumbling through this, figuring it out on your own over here. Yeah. You don't have Ron Loomis. You don't got all these guys over here that are, you know, hitting 15 races a year and doing all this stuff and getting everything figured out. And they've got 20 customers, so they're able to produce parts, test parts, do all that stuff a yeah. lot more. And most of you guys out here are doing it right out of hobby. Yeah, we we were, we were learning as we went along. Yeah. Um, and if somebody did, quite often I, uh, people look to see what we were doing on our car mm -hmm. and very often um, use the same sort of ideas. And then I was building engines for people for race. So first off, if they're not, if they're not full on racers and they're not really mechanically minded, you had to build them an engine to suit them. You, something that's gonna be reliable Still quick, 
but reliable. That's that's the, that's the criterion. Mm -hmm. It's no good having an engine that does one meeting and then you've got to rebuild it. For people that are, are doing it purely as a hobby, mm -hmm. um, they got their own goals. They want to get out on the track, and you give them an engine. And we ended up with like a combination that worked. Not too much compression, you know, FK89, bloody blah, blah, blah. You know, um, we used to use a lot of Delortos, the old tri, the tri-jet Delortos. You, why why'd you like Delortos better than Weber's? Um, because they, they run a lot nicer than IDAs. And to be honest, back in the day, the availability of IDAs over, weren't, wasn't really over here very much. We had, a, there was a few kicking about. A lot of them were old carbs that had been run on rallycross cars or stuff like that. But um, a, lot, a lot of the cars that people raced over here, they used on the road as well. And a De, I, I always found the Delorto was a really nice car. Um, they jetted nicely and they, they were pretty good on fuel for what you get. With you guys being over here on this side of the world and not having as many people drag racing, you guys were a little bit behind the guys in the States. What was it like, and when was the first time you went to the States and saw what they were doing in the States? Um, <clears throat> probably about 89 or 90. It was the first time you went over to the States? Yeah. And you went there for business, or you went there? Um, initially, the first time I went, it was actually for pleasure. Yeah. And did you time it with any racing stuff to go check out racing things? And Oh, yeah. Yeah, what'd you do? We went to um, Arizona to Firebird Raceway mm -hmm. to watch the, uh, the final, or, yeah, the final of the PRA. And, uh, yeah, blew, blew my mind. To see all those drag cars there and all yeah. that stuff going on? Uh, one thing I couldn't understand was how, how many gearboxes broke. Yeah. I, I, I've broken a few, I tell you, but um, even um, I saw the Berg car there, and um, I thought I'd read that they don't break gearboxes, but um, that that year um, they broke at least two on the sat on the Saturday. <laughs> well, and it, and what's crazy is sometimes when when they show up at a track, like if you guys are racing at a, at a runway and stuff like that, here these aren't prep tracks; they're not you know professionally maintained. And then you get out to a racetrack right there where it's unbelievably sticky and you're you're always expecting a little bit of slip, but you get out there and that thing locks and it's game over for all all your parts that require yeah. a little bit of a little bit of slippage. But yeah. I mean our, our tracks weren't that great. They were prepared, but they weren't weren't that great it's a little colder over here so in, in arizona even in october it'll get warm it's lovely and yeah. it'll warm that it'll warm that asphalt up uh, we i think we were probably the only people in t-shirts because <laughs> it's cold for them i suppose but right. yeah, it was lovely for us and so what, what what was your experience like when you saw like what was happening in the states like what what, what was the feeling you got look when you got to the states um i i felt like i had arrived home really uh, we went into la got a hire car and then just drove straight down to um, Arizona. Well, the intention was to drive straight down to Arizona. But after about 100 miles, I could hardly keep my eyes open because I can't sleep on a plane. Yeah. And we pulled into this place. I, c I can't remember what road it was on, but it was the main route through. Mm -hmm. And we pulled off the highway and turned up to the up this little place called Banning. Banning? Yeah, it's, a, it's about 100 miles from L.A. Mm-hmm. And um, it was like, at that point, it was like going back in time. There's pickups everywhere. There's people on horses. We stopped at a place called Grandma's Kitchen, which had had a had a, like an old um, like an old cowboy um, trailer outside, like the, like they used to like, or the, like the Indians were in or something like that. Yeah. And um, we stayed there. Had like a covered wagon out front. That was it. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, and. Uh, <clears throat> and I just imagined myself driving a few miles further in and starting up my own little workshop, repairing anything that I needed doing. <laughs> it looked yeah. like the place you wanted to be. I thought, I know I'm not meant to be in the States forever, yeah. but I'd love to be here with my own little workshop tucked away, repairing stuff, <laughs> building hot rods, yeah, racing Volkswagens. As long as nobody knew I was there and send me home, we were right.
Yeah. So when you go to the drag racing, are you walking through the pits, checking out people's cars, oh, doing yeah. all that stuff? Yeah. What's the What's the, one of the things that really, you know, like you go there and you see something, you think, when I go back, we're changing to this and we're doing this and we're doing that. Or do you remember anybody you ran into during that that really gave you some good insight and advice? Um, <clears throat> a lot of people were busy on their cars, so yeah. I, know, I know not to, you know, mess with them then. But looking around the cars a bit later... I spoke to, um, yeah, there was a there was a real old timer there. I can't remember his name now, but he had a he had a roof chop thirteen oh three. Oh really? What? So he had a chop super it beetle. It, what? I'm just trying to remember. It wasn't Dean Lowry? Was it? Could, couldn't have been Dean Lowry. My, it? my, I don't know. But but he he had a super beetle, and obviously, I've got yeah. a thing about them. You're right. But he had a he had a roof chop one. And uh, he hadn't been out for a bit, and he just had this on an old trailer, on the back of an old Toyota pickup, and he had this nine-second car on it. <laughs> really? Yeah, and I'm like, and then then next to it there was somebody with an Arctic unit with all the all the gear, you know, and there seemed to be. I thought it was all going to be. Um, big setups and stuff like that or not as big as they are now but back then um i thought i thought it was going to be big setups with arctics and and you know all these big pickups with the fifth wheel right. trailers on them and that yet there were some of them but a lot of them but, were a lot of them were people like us yeah you could tell it was really just a yeah. grassroots type thing like like as the well, same yeah. as here right but obviously you've got your people that are right at the forefront of it you know rom townsends and and uh, people like that. And um, there was one of my favorite cars back then was, um, were the turbo cars, to be honest. Yeah, and you guys weren't running turbos over here at the time. Um, Keith Hume was running a turbo in a Beetle. Yeah. At that point, he he ran he ran a K, K World turbo setup on a, with a draw through um, side draft uh, on a car that had been Bernie Smith's at the time, mm -hmm. and he ran that in 1989, and I think that was when the other turbo cars had come over from the States, and uh, his was actually running better than they were. Really? Yeah. Um, but I liked the sound of the turbo. I'd seen, I'd seen the PRA videos, you know, those st street video or street scene, some of those. Yeah, yeah. Or some of those. Yeah, I used to try and get hold of them. And so you get back to the States or you get back from the States and what's your plan of attack? I mean, what do you, what do you start to, what do you start to think that the answer is to start going really fast? I mean, anything you picked up while you were out there that you thought you might start <clears throat> implementing or when Keith starts doing turbo, everybody starts ma maybe messing with turbos and stuff. What's the evolution from that? Um, the evolution from that really was, um, I thought about putting a turbo on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and at this time, you're still working for Auto, Auto oh, yeah, Caban. De definitely, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I worked. I worked for them until '96. Oh, okay. So you're in the, the, quite a while. I was there. I was there as managed for ten years. Yeah, and in the best era for the Volkswagen drag racing. Sure, sure. Uh, for the air cooled stuff. And, and it's and it's a little easier when you're working for a place that can kind of foot the bill for some of the parts, right? I mean, they, oh yeah, they, definitely, they, yeah. So you're doing that. And are you building motors for anybody else at the time, or just for you? No, we would we, had, we ran a workshop. So, so you guys would build if somebody wanted a race motor, you'd build it for them. Yeah, we built race cars, race motors. Um, really? I never did gearboxes for people because I didn't class myself as um, professional enough to mm -hmm. be actually offer that service, even though I built my own. Um, and I I did end up doing some gearboxes for people after they'd had bought pro-built gearboxes mm -hmm. and they had a problem with them, I'd strip them down, see what was wrong with them. And you're like, even some people imported some gearboxes from the States from well-known gearbox places. And when I looked at them, some of them were appallingly bad, really? badly assembled, yeah. I mean, just... I'm not going to make... They, 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 they weren't put together correctly or they were used as stock parts or... Too much too much clearance. And um, where, where they'd machined something wrong, they'd sent the punch around where the bearing went and put the Loctite on it and stuff on a race box. Now, nah, come on, that's just not on, is it? Yeah. Well, and there's always, you know, when, when there's a big demand for people, sometimes 
people's attitude or might be like, oh, they'll take it out, break it anyway. It doesn't matter. Let me just get them through a couple of races. It might well be, but um, <coughs> so I ended up doing, I ended up doing some gearbox for, for customers that I'd done engines for, and they bought gearbox and had problems with them. And I, I then obviously they were good customers, so I said, right, I'll look at your gearbox, see what we can find out, and then I put them right, <coughs> and um, I helped out like that. But uh, I was self, I was self-taught on the Volkswagen racing gearbox thing. But so gearboxes, I mean, that's that's a whole different animal than engines. Yeah. Oh yeah, def- totally different. Yeah. I mean, that's all fitment and press and alignment and those types of things. Yeah, and you know, it's all about how much preload you're going to give the side covers and and all that sort of stuff. And that's something that nobody can tell you really. Mm-hmm. It's something that you just have to. I mean, I built built a gearbox for this. Got a Rhino case in it. And um, how many would, passes you got on this? Um, on the gearbox. Yeah. About sixty, something like that. 50 sixty. 60. And what's the and what is the secret to keeping a gearbox alive? Being a bit of a pansy on the clutch. Yeah. Don't don't sidestep it and kind of. Yeah, I um, you know. I hold the handbrake or the staging brake, have it in gear, bring the clutch up till you can just feel it, just nip the back and then just ease it in, take all the slack out of the transmission and any any of the drive shaft bits or anything. And then, I mean, I, I, I don't sidestep it. I never have done, but um, I've broken enough gearboxes. But a lot of that was because I wasn't preloading it and I was doing a burnout for some reason you end up doing what other people do. <laughs> do you know what I mean? A hundred percent. You know, everything changes till you, till, till, till you roll the first light, till you break that first yeah. beam. And then all of a sudden you get a little hypersensitive. It just happened to me. I, I, I bought my first drag car uh, I bought from a friend. And it's kind of a garage built drag car. But the whole thing, motor and everything for five grand. So I thought, shoot, I'll take this. I bought the motor. Or I bought the car. It's red like yours. And I took it to one of the fast four cartel races, or it was the first Volks group race. And I was there with my buddy, Johnny, and we were running and, uh, you know, the cars, it's real remedial. It's a e-brake, hold up the e-brake. There's no, you know, now I'm putting a, now I'm putting a two-step on it and a handbrake so that I can do less thinking at the light. You know what I mean? Cause no, you don't, last thing you want to do is keep the e-brake up when you're trying to race and all this stuff. And, and, and with me, it was funny. I talked to Doug Berg and he looks at me, he says, you don't have anybody to beat but yourself, man. He says, you just focus on your race. He says, you're just driving the car. You just got to do it the same every time. And I, I didn't understand that one, but then I got up to the line and I'm looking at the guy next to me and I'm, and I'm seeing if he's staging or, or what, you know, what's going on. And, and then I'm, I start, I overwork it in my head. Yeah. Could completely change my game plan, you know? And, yeah, uh, that happens quite easy. Actually. Yeah, and, and and it was funny because it, you know we're, we're talking seconds. You have seconds to kind of get your whole life together to where you're like, okay, repeat these three steps and bang and go. I mean, this this year, a couple of meetings ago, I just something I've never done before, and I, I queried myself, why did I do it? I did a, I did a burnout, came out the burnout, went up to the line, left it in second gear, fried the clutch. <laughs> I've never done that, and I've done hundreds of passes. Yeah. Uh, and why did I do it? I don't know. I won't do it again, though. Yeah. But, you know, um, I, I did it, and it yeah, just dis- destroyed the pressure plate. It's, it, it, it's interesting because everybody can talk a good game from the sidelines when they're watching the racing, and you're, you're behind that wheel with that pressure. And it's, it's bad enough that you're racing the guy next to you when you got stands full of people it's a whole nother, there's just all this pressure and all you're trying to do, I, I equate it to when I was there for the fat, for that Volks group race, I had a bunch of friends that were there, people that know me from the podcast and everybody's excited to see me race. And, and, and it's like when you go golfing with different friends and one tells you to do this, the other tells you to do that. This is how you should swing. And then in your head, you're sitting there getting ready to tee off and you've got what this guy told you and what that guy said. And you're trying to kind of take it all together for one simple swing. It's the same thing. It's one swing, you know, and a friend of mine explained to me the same way. He says, it's one swing. All the clubs are different. 
The clubs are the distance. It's the same swing, you know, because you change, you change everything up every time. And then, you, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at something, you're assessing it differently. And, and I, I saw that with the, uh, <clears throat> at when I was drag racing and I've done a bunch of street, street, street car racing when I've good, like a test and tune night, stuff like that, where I just, you know, I do a little preload with the e-brake and I wasn't really that concerned. I was more, I was more trying to get a fast time. I wasn't worried about beating the guy next to me, <clears throat> but when I was running these races recently, we had a dial in class and then the dial in put all the pressure on me, you know, and I'm like, that's what, that's what we do. Yeah. And, I, and, and, and in my head, I'm just, I'm overthinking it so much. Yeah. So, so the goal is to try to just be consistent, you know? <clears throat> yeah. I mean. But so you, so you campaign the car for <clears throat> what's the fastest you get that car to run and what are the different general stages of that car? What the, what the 1303? Mm -hmm. Um, basically when I, when I turboed it, um, what turbo kit did you use? Dave Kaywell. Oh, so you got a Kaywell turbo set up on it? Yeah. Uh, the old Ray J and the Side Drive 48. Um, and a Magneto. That was it. Nothing else. No rev limiter. Basic. No, yeah. Basic. Yeah, that's basically what this is, really. Mm -hmm. And um, the quickest that car went was um, well, it, I had a couple of spurious runs at another track and it ran quicker. But I never really I never really claimed that much because I I don't know just just didn't I didn't feel it mm -hmm. whereas the other the, it ended up doing 10 10 65 126 oh wow that's, that's what fast. it did um and it was still it was still street legal that's a fit so this did it have a big wing and all that stuff on the back but by the time you guys were done with it um so it I, didn't I, have, I put a wing on the roof. But it didn't have the big aluminum boxes on the back like no, all, the, all no. the turbo cars in the States had and no, all that stuff? It was just a floor just a floor pan car with struts at the front, obviously. No, uh, caged or just a... Had a, a bolt-in safety devices cage, which are illegal now. You can't yeah. drag race with it now. <laughs> so this was bare bones, and the fast, yeah. you, the fast you got it down to was how fast again? 1065. 1065, and that's, that's moving. 126, yeah, it, it was... It started, the handling went off as they, I, t uh, I raced that in 93 with a turbo and that's basically the last year I raced until recently. And so you did, you haven't raced since when? I, um, what, I mean, you stopped racing in 96? I stopped racing in 93. In 93. Because I started building a car that was going to optimize the regulations. Mm-hmm. I was building a chrome molly tube frame car with a floor pan, street legal. And um, basically around then where my marriage went wrong, mm -hmm. I was spending too much time at the garage, et cetera, et cetera, you know, usual. And um, yeah, uh, I, I built the car at the point where it needed paint and wiring and stuff. I realized that it was a car that I couldn't really run myself. I had ladder, ladder bar rear, uh, narrow, narrowed axles. Uh, yeah, looked like looked like a proper race beetle, actually, as opposed to like a floor pan car like this one. Cause, right. I mean, you've only got to look at it, see where it sits. It's a floor pan car. You know, I've raised the engine and box a little bit, um, but you can't really do any more than that without upsetting the way the suspension works. So, but that car, it, and it was a thir still the thirteen oh three. I used the thirteen oh three body shell. Oh really. Because uh, that basically that car in '93 ended up having handling problems, and I en I ended up running the boost from 18 pound down to 12 pound to try and keep it in a straight sure. line, and it was probably only putting out about 320 brake something like that. Hmm. And um, but yeah, it was uh, it was for back then it was well quick. And so you stop racing, things kind of change for you in your life for a little bit. Yeah. Now, do you start building engines for people, or what do you do? You kind of just pull back from the whole scene, or what? No, um, I carried on at Autocavan until till, uh, 96, mm -hmm. and then I ended up, basically what happened with that was, um, it was decided overall that they were going to shut the workshops. Or, it was just business was slowing workshop. down, everything was evolving out? Not, or? not necessarily, it was the, uh, there was, in the end, there was nine branches of Autocavan, and I ran one of the branches, and um, it was... It, there was only, I think there's only two workshops, one at Bournemouth and one in Ipswich in the end. And um, it was deemed that 
more financially viable to spend more time selling parts than mm -hmm. uh, and, than and running a workshop because we had a shop as well um, and I, I did that for a bit to be fair and um, it, it was, was time for a change yeah basically so Which what what did you go do after that I went and worked at a Volkswagen main dealer oh really yeah like at a dealership huh yeah now because you were trained and you had worked at these other places was it easy just to walk on there or did you have to prove yourself I had to prove myself but it was a, a firm that was just down the road yeah and because we used to run a workshop we got a lot of their vehicles that they couldn't fix in our place to fix mm -hmm. because the uh, main dealers tend to like getting a car in doing a quick diagnosis blaming an ECU getting a new ECU <laughs> yeah put it in and then finding it isn't that oh yeah. well and then tell the customer that they have to go through that procedure and fit this and fit that to right to process that, of elimination on the is, customer's wallet and I've worked at a couple of dealerships where they've done that that's insane and I can't I can't handle that yeah anyway I worked there for six years and then um, now were you still involved in VWs at all or you kind of took a break from the whole thing um, no I still, I still ran Volkswagens on the road oh you did oh yeah yeah I've, I've virtually always had Volkswagens I think yeah and um, I had a I had an old T25 van mm -hmm. panel van that I put a tuned Golf GTI engine in it took the old diesel lump out put that in there and it was a bit of a tatty old thing but it was well handy motor used to tow loads of stuff with it so you were you were always in the mod stuff and then what makes you decide so from that time to this car that's your drag racing break yeah um yeah basically yeah now what's the story on unfinished business well because i there's various things of this first off i'm an old git yeah and obviously getting older yeah so time's limited for doing something like this mm -hmm. and i felt like because i couldn't finish that last car and get that out on the track i felt i could have gone quicker so i was talking to my wife about and she she knows that i'm right into the drag racing whether it be v8s or volkswagens or whatever quick cars that mm -hmm. handle or anything you know a petrol head i suppose that's what i am i built a few cars at home meanwhile built the 55 chevy as a from the ground up built a 59 uh, Apache Chevy pickup. Nice. And I rebuilt my um, 52 Prefect that I built originally in 81, 82. Still got them. And um, and then um, I built a race uh, a race car for a friend of mine that he does track days in. And then a friend of mine got a a Westfield kit car um, with a Suzuki Hayabusa engine in yeah. that he was going to do track days in so stupidly I agreed to go along with him to this track day, to the track day. <laughs> and he let me have a drive in it and I was absolutely blown away with the handling and the performance yeah. so I didn't have much money but I needed one so that's that was basically when I sold all the the original turbo engine and the tube frame with the floor pan that I was building up into the other car because I kept that for years wanting to get on with it yeah and I never did so I ended up you know I built a Westfield and I but I couldn't afford a Hayabusa engine so I put a Honda Blackbird engine in it mm -hmm. and um, I did track days in it and a couple of years later I decided to turbo it so I built a turbo system for it with it made me only into coolers and that sort of stuff exhaust and th and um that is i've still got that it's ballistically quick yeah um it's well driving on a track this is like a road course track yeah like not proper circuits yeah yeah th that's a completely you know drag race too and i've taken a car to a road course and unless you've been on a like a proper track like that you've never driven until you've driven like that because it's yeah. flat out trying to push the limits of the car yeah. and you know I, I did it in my 996 that i had and that's a, it, it was a fairly fast car and it felt unbelievably slow because i just kept trying to beat my time 
around the track. But yeah, yeah. it's a it's an experience, and I and I and and I I, I lo- I'm the same. I love all motorsports. I love if I'm behind the wheel and I'm driving, I'm happy. And uh, you know, the you know, drag racing might be ten seconds in a straight line, but you're on that track. You're on it for thirty minutes. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I mean, that's some work, so. Uh, but with drag racing, it's trying to do it in a straight line, isn't it? That's the, yeah, that's that, the beauty it is. of it. Yeah, if you, get, if you get enough power, then you have a tough time keeping it straight and <laughs> keep it on the ground. But, um, so then you, you decide to start building this car. So, so you're running the track circuit, doing that stuff with your, your Blackbird car. And then what, what, um, what it possesses you to get <clears throat> this? I just, I'd had this yearning for a long time to... Have, have a quick beetle on the road. And um, eventually I thought, I discussed it with my wife and we thought, right, not getting any younger. Probably haven't got many years left when I can do anything. So I'm going to give it one last shot. Nice. And I didn't build this car from scratch. It was built by somebody who wanted it as a show car. But they built it to basically look like a race car. Mm-hmm. So they had a proper roll cage put in it, um, had it painted, had a, a fairly mild engine put in it and stuff, uh, with standard gearbox. So it sort of looked the part, but, you know, wasn't. So anyway, I looked at the car and it was, nice, it was nicely put together. So I bought it and then I'd converted it into a race car. So you- so you end up finishing the job and making it a, a legitimate racer. Yeah. And um, I got it in 2019. I ran it for one meet in there. The engine that was in it seized up before I got to the end of the track. Oh, wow. And um, so then I, deci- I decided to build an engine. And what an engine you built. I'm looking at this thing yeah. here. What, what's, this, what's the setup on this motor that you got in here? Well, when I first built it, uh-huh. it was normally aspirated. Yeah. It's a 2276 with a scat crank, five and a half inch scat rods, JPM MS250 cylinder heads from Sweden, um, JPM five stud rocker assembly, JPM push rods. Um, it's got um, TP uh, tall steel lifters in it because they're mega lightweight. Um, uh, yes, yeah, um, and it's got a Ron Loomis turbo exhaust, um, one of his turbos with billet wheels and stuff, and a 750 Holly. And what, have you had this on the rolling dyno? No. So you haven't dyno tuned it yet. You said originally you were, you were working on it with EFI and- uh, when, when it was normally aspirated, it had EFI on it. Oh, it did. What, what EFI setup did you have on there? It was a, um, probably nothing you've heard of. It was an emerald. Um, K6. So something from over here? Yeah. And you couldn't find somebody that could help you get it tuned in enough to where you could be happy with the car? Yeah, I couldn't get it to launch properly. Mm-hmm. It was uh, just bogging off the line. And in drag racing, if anything bogs off the line, it's a pathetic time. Yes. End of story. It's no, no point even trying to go quick because it just won't. And the quickest I got it to go was a 12 0. And the engine put out 268 brake at 8,300 hmm. on the rollers. So that was way off what it should have run. And what? And so you decide to turbo it. You you leave the twenty two seventy six alone on the bottom end. What's the turbo setup? What's what's the compression on the motor? Um, nine point seven. And so nine point seven, which is a little high for typically statistically, but I know other people that run a lot of high compression turbo yeah. motors. So you run a nine point seven, and then you said this car you've had on only five pounds of boost. Yes, it's. Not- I, I had it on 14, but it wouldn't go in a straight line. It was wheel spinning. Just too much gear. power? It, yeah, for the setup. Mm-hmm. right? Because you know, as well as I do, you can't just chuck an engine in a car and expect no. it to go quick. Everything's got to work right. Yeah, um, my podcast with Ron Loomis, we talked about the importance of setting up your suspension so the car goes yeah. straight, it hooks. I mean, there's so much time to be saved just in the suspension and, yeah. the, and the rebound of the shocks. I mean, everything. So... Yeah, there's there's a lot to it, you know. I mean, especially when you're starting to put real power down. I mean, if you're just running a 14 second pass, there's, you know, it's not a lot going on there. But no, as soon you as can, you start, you, you can tweak that little tiny bit with tire pressures and RPM launch and stuff. But it's all in about the same window, isn't it? Yeah, when you start pushing past 11s and doing things like that, and you're trying to go faster, all that stuff starts to matter because you're pushing a lot more mile an hour. I had a when 
<clears throat> basically the engine itself is the same as it was when it's normally aspirated mm -hmm. apart from it's got a, a Ron Loomis tur a turbo cam in it I mean I, I had a bit of a discussion with Ron I wanted to make all the intake stuff and everything myself because that's what I do and um, and they had nothing that would fit the these heads anyway because they're they're different so um, I just bought the base the basic bits I could from from Ron but we had a good chat I told him that I didn't want to have to launch it and bump it in on a two-step I wanted it to boost it off the clutch and so I, I told him what sort of times I wanted to run um, realistically not you know what I'd really like to run yeah not pie in the sky yeah. yeah that's right yeah so I wanted to run some realistic times um, I told him I got a type 1 transmission which I'm not going to put a type 2 transmission in um, and I said I want it boosting off the clutch <clears throat> and which obviously limits what turbo you can run yeah so he did a turbo with a different um housing and a different uh billet wheels and stuff and he matched it with one of his um p it's got a pt2 cam in it and um he told me what compression ratio i need to run so that's what i'm running and um i think it's putting out more power than um because he basically said on about 14 pound boost, mm -hmm. it will deliver the power to run the times that you wanted. And I, I was looking at hoping 10 fives. And now you've had this car out. Yeah. And it's been kind of a battle getting it straight and getting it to go right. And and what what's it run for you? It's it's now run a, a 1036 and 134 mile an hour. So you were hoping for 1050s. Yeah. And you ran a 1036, and that's still with the car a little bit not under control. No, not the, where you want it to be. The car's, I think the car's somewhere near where it needs to be now, but we need some more boost. Um, <laughs> and that's on five pounds of boost you ran a 1039? 1036. 1036. And five pound boost, yeah. On five pounds of boost, wow. Um, I, like I say, I did try it on 14 pound boost, but it wouldn't go straight and it was wheel spinning. So I tend to revert. I don't tend to struggle with something like that. I'll revert back on boost and then hopefully get it somewhere where it's a car I can trust and then move it on. And um, it's running, um, I've run a few 139 60 foots, which is not, not bad. I've only got seven inch slicks and um, I've got a black magic center plate and a stage one pressure plate, which is set up to give the best pressure. But um, I did tr when I ran a twelve thirty the ten thirty six. I tried. I thought right, that's probably about as good as it's going to get. I'll now put ten pound for it and see where we go. I put ten pound boost in it and uh, straight away it just eight thousand revs in first and second slipping the clutch. Oh. So um, that's incredible. I mean, that's a lot, it just shows you got a lot of power in I, there. I you think yeah, I think the power is. Obviously, in the in the turbo setup, but I think the heads are delivering more power than a lot. I've spent a lot of time on the heads, even though they're really nice from um, Johannes. You spent more time detailing them. Yes. Yeah. I've, I, over the years, I've I've done some pretty good head work for for vehicles that have made good power for circuit races, and so I've just got. And the, once I had a. You asked me earlier about who I spoke to um, it, when I was in America. Mm -hmm. and, and the person I remember speaking to now was Sean McCarthy. Oh, yeah. And we had a quite a long chat in a hotel um, lobby or where the, you know, he had a beer yeah. uh, about selling the heads, uh, about the way. We, we had a good chat about cylinder heads and I, I realised a way that I do a lot of the head work is the way it, he, he said, you're, you're spot on really, what your, what your way of thinking is. So that, that gave me a bit, a bit of confidence that um, I was sort of going the right way with the way I... Because you have to visit... I, I haven't got a flow bench. Right. But you have to 
I visualise the way the air goes through, mm -hmm. right from the carburetor, right through into the into the chamber. And I've spoken to people about head work before, and a lot of people are just involved in hogging the hot ports out as right. big as you can get them. And that's not what I do. Yeah, well, it's funny with my, uh, uh, in my interview that I did with Clyde Berg, he talks about being at the head shop with Lonnie Reed and a bunch of guys, and they're all hanging out. And Lonnie had a flow bench there, and so they're all messed with it. And they had some clay there. And, you know, Lonnie had these heads all hogged out and everything. And Ron, go, and, and uh, I'm sorry, Clyde goes back in there and takes some clay and starts changing the port, making it a little bit smaller. And it flowed more, you know, and it's like, like you're saying, it's not all about hogging it out. It's about knowing how the air flows and making yeah. sure that you're able to get it to perform. And getting the short term radius to flow nicely and to get the bowl of the port under the valve and the, the valve job and the way it flows past the valve into the port is the hardest area to get right. And it's dead easy to put something out of the big... Right. But when you're flowing it around past the valve and um, the, way, uh, the way it flows around the side of the valve where it gets shrouded by the side of the, the barrel and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I mean, sometimes you... you I, I found, especially on golf engines, running a, not a smaller valve, but not the optimum size in the old eight valve golf GTI engines, we found running a smaller valve gave more flow round the side of the valve because of the small size of the bore, because they're only like 81 mil bore. Yeah. And by running the, the smaller valve than the optimum, what you'd think you could get in there, we actually got made more power. <laughs> yeah. So, it's it, there's a there's a lot of things in something that we've been doing for a long time engines as a as a automotive people there's a lot still to be learned because everything starts with theories and every now and again you'll get these changes in the way these theories work yeah. you know especially when it comes to racing you know I was watching my buddy and he was taken off and brought the front wheels up and he said I'm going to lessen my rebound on the front I said how's that going to affect the rear but it's all connected you know the less rebound on the front the yeah. more you know, the, the, the more, the less weight transfer and it's, you know, so it, it, it's interesting as we keep doing something we've been doing for a long time, we can still find these little things that we can adjust and tweak to get, you know, a little more, a little more what we're looking for, for performance. Yeah. So what's, uh, so what's the plan for this? Are you going to bring this out? How many more times you have to take this out? Is there some races this year or are you getting no, to I've, the end of the I've, year? I finished for now. Yeah. I mean, 1036 is pretty awesome yeah, I'm, to, I'm, to run that, you know, so. You see up, up there. Yeah. Where it's got JB above it. Uh-huh. That's what I was predicting I'd hope to do. Oh, really? 1034. 1034. Yeah, so I, I haven't quite hit my aim, but. Yeah, you're close. Know. Yeah. You're close. Now you just got to dial it back and, and, and do that. So next year you'll be out, you'll campaign this car next season, try oh, yeah. to get out as yeah. much as you can and. I need to do some work on the clutch. Mm -hmm. um, whether I'm just going to go stage two in a black magic, I'm not sure. But I think I need to do something with it because that's two clutches I've fried this year. Maybe that Rev 6 that Ron has, that too much clutch for this? Yes, because of the transmission. Mm, yeah, it's going to... Yep. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to get the 60 foots down to 136 mm -hmm. without, without doing, hopefully doing too much shock loading to the transmission. Um, and I, I'm thinking about dry sumping it and running more boost. Uh, but the rest of it is going to stay the same. Well, and, and so now, what are you doing nowadays? What? Well, overall, like nowadays you're in your shop here. Are you, you just doing private work? You open to the public? Or are you just... No, no, I, um, I've got to earn money. <laughs> yeah. Somebody's got to pay for the racing. Sure, they? sure. <laughs> But um, yeah, mainly I do metalwork fabrication and restorations like that. And um, I, rest I restored the body shell on the on Lee's pickup truck. So you do a lot. Of, I mean, you get a lot of work because you're right over here, right by Andy's place across the alley here. Yeah. And so he keeps you fairly busy with a lot of stuff on your plate all the time. or Yeah, basically when I decide I started this business when I was 60. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. So... Um, been going six years now, so um, time's running out. Yeah. But um, I started, I started um, doing a few bits for Andy, 
bit of fabrication and stuff because I've always been able to make stuff with metal and I've always done welding. And Andy wanted me to start building. When I was thinking about starting up on my own, Andy suggested I start building engines because I used to do lo loads of engines. And they were, I did one for him for his Type 3 recently-ish, a few years ago. And um, we sort of reconnected when he, when he started his business, probably about 10 years ago now, I reckon it yeah. was. And um, I've, I've known Andy for a, a long time. Yeah, he says you're quite an engine builder. He says you build some really good engines. I, I, yeah, I, I used to. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully I still can, but yeah. I only really do it for myself. So you don't like the, but you you rather just do metal work for people and fabrication. They need a custom intake manifold, fabbed up stuff like that. Is that the stuff you do, or are you just doing? I, I can, mainly I've been doing bodywork restoration, mm -hmm. but yeah, I I like doing other stuff like that. Right, any kind of fab work, things like that, you can really do. If it's metal, we like welding it. And if people want to get a hold of you, how do they find you? Uh, just um, I'm on Facebook and that. So you're on Facebook under JB's Elite Fabrications. JB's Elite Fabrication. So. If you guys are needing any of that stuff with, uh, you know, that's tied into whether you need some metal work done on your car or panels changed, things like that, that's kind of what, that's what you do? Yeah, I mean, I have started doing a bit of mechanical work for Andy. Yeah. Um, as this um, unbelievable uh, split window yeah. bus with 10, the body shell on that is just fantastic. Yeah, not from England, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, it's, it's not been rusting about over here very long. Right, right. Um, but uh, I um, I do um, I like doing dual carb setups and balancing and tweaking. So I like it. I like doing a bit. Of, I did one. I did one the other week on somebody's really really nice bay window with two two liter bay window. Yeah. So you still got it in you. You still love to solve the problems, right? I mean, that's really what it comes down to when you're. Yeah, when you're tweaking carbs, it, right? It's that hideously gentle bit where you're just opening the throttle and they're opening at the same time and you can you know it's that it's that that fettling that do the nut up slightly too tight and it alters it just that little tiny bit doesn't it you know and I yeah you know that last nip on the on the on the little eight mil or eight mil headed nut and it just alters on the thread just that bit you know, I'm a bit of a bit of a ponce when it comes to doing carburetor <laughs> linkage really to be honest um, but I think that comes from when I used to have to make linkage mm -hmm. and you have to make all the arms the same and then, you know, find out why they're not opening exactly the same all the way through the range. Yeah. Sometimes you file the file a little hole out a bit to alter the ratio just a touch, you know, just to get it nice and yeah, smooth. Yeah, perfect. And because um, so many twin carb Volkswagen air-cooled engines, the carburetor linkage is out and I absolutely hate Hearing them, right? All the car, all the cars drive around running on three cylinders and uh, and and not dialed in. When, and when I used to race years ago, <clears> when, when there was lots of air cooled, because the Volkswagen racing now is mainly water cooled stuff. Mm -hmm. There's only a handful of us, really, that are regularly on on the strip. With it. there's the Outlaw Flat Four lot. We've got some really nice cars, fairly quick cars. Yeah, um, but they don't race with the VW DRC. Um, they only do heads up racing and my car's not quick enough to do heads up racing so I don't mm, do that it's pretty quick but they've got cars that run nine threes and stuff so in heads up there's no point in even trying if you're just going to wait for somebody to break before you get to the end of the track that's you know I know you've got to keep running to win everybody's got a bad day at the light one day <laughs> yeah yeah uh, but you have to be of a pretty bad light if I'm running ten threes and somebody else is running nine threes. Yeah. You know, and they're they're running like 150 mile an hour terminals and stuff. So well, that's crazy. But um, yeah, so they're 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 the, sort of the air cooled lot really. I mm -hmm. think now, and sometimes there's quite a few of them that go to Bug Jam. They uh, quite a few of them turn up, but there's, there's some there's there's some nice cars in that in there for air cooled stuff. There is. Um, no, it's it's interesting. It's we've seen it kind of get smaller and smaller over the years. The drag racing circuit, and uh, I don't know. I don't know what it would take to kick it back up. You know, they're doing real street stuff in California and some other stuff. But I like I like that. Yeah, that's good. It's it's a. Uh, 
it's 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 in fun it's enjoyable to do but people seem to be you know so focused on a lot of different things and so just support the drag racers you guys see out there go watch them race and uh i don't know but uh john i appreciate the time that you took to kind of tell me your story and uh yeah it's probably bored most people no no it's great and and, you know because you you've been around racing since the early days of all the guys out here racing and, and being a part of that and you know it's just locking in that history you know of what happened and who was there and what took place and all that good stuff so definitely uh, appreciate you sitting down with me and uh who knows maybe we'll, we'll maybe we'll chat again someday soon It'd be nice if we chat in america wouldn't it yeah anytime yeah. you got to come with andy <laughs> come down with andy and we got a spot for you all right i appreciate yeah, thank it thank you very much indeed thanks appreciate it well if you like that podcast and i'm certain that you did make sure you share this podcast with your friends we're almost at 300 uh five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts. So I'd like for you guys to go, even if you don't want to type out a review, go leave a review on Apple Podcast, And uh, let's see if we can't hit 500 reviews. Come on, guys. Give me 500 reviews. It's the least you guys could do for me for all the hard work and effort I put in this podcast. I do it because I love you guys. I do it because I love the hobby. Um, I did want to mention that our event next year is already scheduled for October uh, 4th and 5th. But this year, we're actually going to be going on the third. We're starting the third, fourth, and fifth. And so there's a lot of, I'm going to go ahead and squash all the nonsense right now about, oh, why is he putting it that weekend, all this. You know, I'm working with a gigantic hotel and casino that's given me the date. So that date's kind of set in stone. Vegas has always typically been the first weekend in October, forever. So there's a lot of shows that are out and they're like, oh, you, you know, you're stepping on our show and stuff like that. Vegas goes back to 1993 with the first weekend in October with the drag races, bug in and all that kind of stuff. And it's been going on for all these years, 25 years, a couple years, hit, miss, a couple years in and out. It didn't happen. Um, when we got our event back on, our intention when we started our event in 2020 was to put it on and get everything going again first weekend in October, first, second weekend. And unfortunately, we're at the mercy of the hotel and casino. So, you know, you know, it, it, it's a bummer, but, uh, you know, we had a ton of people. There's a lot of people in the hobby. There's enough for all the events to go around. Uh, I wish we could make everybody happy, but unfortunately, you know, it, it is what it is. But I'm excited because this year we're going to be starting Thursday. And Thursday is going to be a wide open, day long, citywide chip collecting opportunity to go to tourist spots in Vegas where you're going to get VIP parking. You're going to get a discount on admission to whatever it's going to be, whether it's a museum or something having to do with Vegas only culture and history. You'll get a commemorative chip that's tied into the one crazy weekend and it's going to be something cool. Kind of go at your own leisure. You can hit two spots. You can hit four spots, whatever there's going to be. You can hit it. More details will unfold as that comes. But what I envision is that you guys that are bringing your Volkswagens here to Las Vegas will get to drive your Volkswagens to cool tourist locations that you would want to go check out if you came to Vegas anyway. But because you're in your Volkswagen, you get to park up front and you get a discount and you get a commemorative chip for going there. So just something fun to do on the weekend. So you bring your car here. It's not just sitting in a parking lot. You're out and about and you're using that uh, to get around in Vegas and enjoying the time here. So more on that will unfold. I'm going to give out the room discount code as soon as I get the contract from the hotel. Uh, They've solidified our dates for 2024, 25, and 26. So we're we're already planning uh, the next three years in advance. And this next year is going to be a monster. So there's a couple of surprise things that are happening, but it's going to be a fun event. It's going to be a driving event. It's going to be get in on the road in town in Vegas and have a great time. So, uh, you know, much respect to everybody else putting on other events. You know, it, it is what it is, and, and uh, I can't move the mountain. So um, our event's been growing like crazy, and I'm sure there's plenty of people in the hobby to go around to appreciate other events. It's a bummer because I, like I like to enjoy those other events as well, but there's not much I can do, and we're just going to keep the steam rolling on our event. It was a monster this year. I can't even describe to you how big it was, and everybody that comes – brings a friend the following year and that's how we've doubled in size every year that it's been going because it's a it's a fantastic venue the property is great the hotel rooms are super we got hotel rooms wednesday and thursday are 40 bucks a night 
Friday, Saturday, $90 a night. I mean, that's ridiculously cheap for Vegas. You can't get rooms that cheap anywhere. So not only we take care of you with the room discounts, uh, but we also provide a bunch of good opportunities for you to enjoy your Volkswagen out here in uh, Sin City, the City of Lights, making it happen. And uh, I'm stoked for that. Hopefully I'll see a lot of people. Um, again, I know there's some conflicting events and it's, it's a bummer, but not much I can do about it. So, uh, other than that, guys, I'm looking forward to the next podcast that's going to be coming out for you guys. Lots of good stuff coming up and until next week later, you probably don't know that there's a new Volkswagen out that doesn't look like a Volkswagen. Volkswagen.